Hello, I'm Dr. Stephen Hassan with another episode of the Influence Continuum. I have a special guest, a Protestant scholar with me, and uh, I, I watched Matthew Taylor and I saw a documentary he put together for his institute um, called Spiritual Warriors, Decoding Christian Nationalism at the Capitol Riot. And I said, Matthew, please come on on my influence continuum because we need more, in my opinion, real Christians who actually know the Bible and care about religion to speak out against what's happening in the United States. So let me just get to your bio real fast. You're a senior scholar at the Institute for Islamic, Christian, and Jewish Studies, where you specialize in Muslim-Christian dialogue evangelical and Pentecostal movements, religious politics in the United States, and American Islam. You have a published book called Scripture People, Salafi Muslims in Evangelical Christians America by Cambridge University Press, and it offers an introduction to the oft-misunderstood Salafi movement in the United States by way of comparison with American evangelicalism. I want to ask you about that. I'm very interested. And you have a forthcoming book I want to plug uh, called The Violent Take It by Force, The Christian Movement That is Threatening Our Democracy. And it tracks the role of Christian leaders, particularly those from the New Apostolic Reformation Networks, and it, that it played such an, uh, a major role in instigating Christians to participate in the January 6th Capitol riot and I say coup. So, Matthew D. Taylor, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Steve. It's, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm, I'm honored that you would have me on. Oh, well, the honor is mine. And I, like I said, I really love that Christian scholars, uh, people who genuinely believe in Jesus, who know the historical Jesus and cite the scripture and know that this you know, these bogus, in my opinion, bogus Christians who say, you know, I'm an apostle. God told me Trump won the election, so we'll ignore all facts, even from Trump elected officials. And people say, send me your money. I need more money. Give me another jet. Give me another mansion. And you, God will bless you. Like, Jesus didn't teach any of that. And I want, I want you to tell people your your work and what you're yeah. what you're trying to accomplish with your new book and i love the doc uh spiritual warriors i watched that thank you for doing that and that's on yeah. the institute's youtube channel i believe right yeah if you just search spiritual warriors in in youtube or you can go to um the institute for islamic christian and jewish studies uh channel and it's it's on there as well it's, it's great free and, and we're gonna do a blog and we're gonna have the link directly right. from my website and we're starting a sub stack so it'll be there too matthew um where shall we begin shall we start with the spiritual warriors and then circle to salafi salafi muslims and then come back to your new book how's that I, I, i'm happy to talk about everything that i study and work on so yeah you, well, you tell us guy. about the institute first because i didn't know yeah. it existed until i saw you uh doing a podcast so uh, I work at the Institute for Islamic, Christian, and Jewish Studies in Baltimore. Um, we were actually founded as the Institute for Christian and Jewish Studies in 1987. Um, it, it we're an independent nonprofit, um, an academic nonprofit. So we aren't um, affiliated with any um, degree-granting institutions. We we do our own fundraising. We work with a lot of degree-granting institutions for a lot of our programs, but we we're our own organization. Um, we do interreligious peace building and education in Baltimore, but we also have national audiences and uh, most of our things post COVID especially are all online. And we try to offer all of our programming for free to the public. So Fantastic. we have donors who fund the, the work that we do and we have an endowment that we, we, we live off of, but um, we try to make things as accessible and, and free to the public as possible. We have fellowship programs that we run for teachers, for congregational leaders, for civic leaders to try to help them think about interreligious dialogue and pluralism in their fields. 
Um, we work with seminarians and rabbinical students and Muslim leaders in training. We've got a whole bevy of programs, and um, we we do great stuff. So I, I welcome people to just check out our website, come and and join us for the events that we have and the courses that we run. It's fantastic. I I love your work, and I I, I participated. I contributed a chapter in a social psychiatry book on Islamophobia and psychiatry. I did one on anti-Semitism and psychiatry with my lens of authoritarian cults. And yeah. people forget there's a continuum. There are ethical, love-based, honesty-based, you know, charity, compassion-based, and then the extremists that want to burn everybody else up, think they're this the only chosen people and think everyone else are enemies. And it's they, they, they have such a loud voice, even though it's a, just a small subset. And part of how we approach interreligious dialogue and interfaith conversations is we very much treasure and value the differences between these traditions. We are not here to homogenize or minimize our differences, but we think that you can learn from difference. The difference presents an opportunity, especially religious difference, where you're encountering a worldview and a way of thinking about life, a way of thinking about the world that is very different across these different traditions. But then we find these moments of similarity, moments of kinship, moments of friendship that emerge out of that. They don't, they don't remove the differences, but in some ways live through the differences. And that's really the goal that we have. Um, so we're, we're not just doing kind of a, a kumbaya, aren't we all the same kind of conversation. Right. We really do live into the things that where are, are, there are tensions between our traditions. Right. But we share, the three our major religions share a common Abrahamic code of keeping your tent open <laughs> to feed or to give water to the stranger, right? And, 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 and so people need to remember the roots and the common stories uh, uh, that we all share as, as, yeah. um, as scholars. So um, I guess I also, I'm going to take liberty of using my uh, deprogrammer hat. I hate that word, by the way, but when I'm working with people in Jewish cults, Christian cults or Islamic cults, I, 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 I like to cite the Garden of Eden story to everybody, however you want to understand it. Almighty God, beyond space and time, didn't choose to brainwash Adam and Eve to be obedient. Like for me, the divine being wanted us to choose and follow in faith and not be coerced. So, and then if we accept that notion, a group 2,000 years later that says you need to be brainwashed and coerced to follow the truth, it's not the biblical God of our traditions. Am I off base? Because I've never run it by a no, Protestant I scholar before. <laughs> No, I, I think I, I think that is also the mainstream Christian interpretation is that there is freedom. Obviously, Christians have have different interpretations of that passage than uh, our Jewish siblings, um, and uh, there, there's the notion that um, after the Garden of Eden, right now you have at least if you're kind of following the trajectory of Augustine and Western Christianity, original sin, right? Yeah. That our our wills have been bent towards evil. Um, but th similar values are present in the Islamic tradition, for sure. I mean, the, the, there's explicit instruction in the Quran that there should be no coercion in religion, mm. right? And so I think I think um, the mainstream religious traditions is maybe how I'd phrase it. Yeah. Um, because I think I would say people can be bad Muslims and still be Muslims, bad Christians and still be Christians, bad Jews and still be Jews. Um, but the mainstream traditions have tended to reject the, this notion of coercion, at least uh, in their best versions, right? We, we, we all, all of our traditions have their complicated histories as well. Yep, exactly. So um, talk to me about spiritual warriors. I watched this documentary and I thought it was so, I mean, it, it, it was in my confirmation bias of everything I've studied and what I learned about the January 6th. But tell our listeners who haven't seen it yet what what the essence of what you 
um, say in that? Well, Spiritual Warriors, is, it's a 25-minute YouTube documentary um, that uh, actually we, we won a, a short documentary award for it um, just a couple weeks ago. Um, Great, congrats. And, um, it was produced by ICJS, and it's it's rooted in, in the research that I've been doing. So since January 6, 2021, I've been uh, trying to dig into who were the Christian leaders who were central to organizing January 6. Now, I, I, I want to be clear. I'm not saying that Christians were the only people who participated in January 6. There were a lot of different groups that were there. And I'm not saying that these Christian leaders were, were the sole driving force, right? Obviously, January 6th is instigated by Donald Trump, by his supporters, um, and, but but there's a spirituality to January 6th. There, mm. there, there's a spiritual ethos, a genre of Christianity that's on display that day, and the documentary is trying to get underneath that, to understand what is that, what is that spirituality that's manifesting? Where did it come from? And we trace it back to the New Apostolic Reformation. Before we did this documentary, we actually, um, I, 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 about a year ago, so in late 2020 and early 2020, uh, 2022 and early 2023, we, we released an a audio documentary through the Straight White American Jesus podcast feed. Um, it's five episodes, total of about eight hours, um, about the New Apostolic Reformation in January 6th. And in there, we it's 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 very exhaustive. It's in some ways the first draft of my book is in this uh, po- this podcast documentary series. Um, and so, with charismatic revival fury, we really wanted to integrate in the voices of um, these new apostolic reformation leaders and give people a sense of just the audio of of January sixth. It, not everyone has eight hours to, right. to devote to, to this stuff. And so um, about la- this past summer, summer of, of 2023, um, we started working on this documentary um, uh, called Spiritual Warriors. It really tries to condense this down into about 25 minutes in a right. more kind of digestible version. And um, and that, that we released that at the very end of January 2024. So it's, it's fresh, new new documentary, free to the public on YouTube. Right. And my regular listeners have heard me talking about New Apostolic Reformation since I wrote The Cult of Trump in 2019. But let's assume new people are listening to this interview. Can you take a few minutes and explain what it is and how it deviates from real, you know, mainstream Christianity? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the New Apostolic Reformation um, was a phrase that was coined in 1996, um, and it um, became the moniker of, it it originally starts as a theory and then becomes a set of institutions. Um, And so the way that this this evolved, if you go back um, to the the rise of Pentecostalism in the 20th century, um, Pentecostalism is marked by this renewed um, investment and interest in a sort of ecstatic and experiential spirituality within Christianity that is marked by things like speaking in tongues, things like uh, prophesying. Um, and as Pentecostalism is, is emerging in the 20th century, it's a global movement. Um, but in, in the 1940s, in the late 1940s in Canada, a movement emerges called the Latter Rain or right. the New Order of the Latter Rain, which is a, a, rev- a Pentecostal revival. And in that revival, they began speaking about the the, the return of apostles and prophets. Um, and if you know your New Testament, the apostles are the, the, the really the foundational leaders of the church, the disciples of Jesus. Um, and in the New Testament, it also speaks of prophets as as a role or a, 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 a gift that is given in the by the Holy Spirit to the early church. And so the latter reigns start believing that the, that the end times, the, the end of history. Will, the church will see a return of apostles and prophets to govern the church. Um, and these ideas percolate around in what we call the independent charismatic sector. This mm. is non-denominational charismatic spirituality. Kind of think of like Pentecostalism without denomination. So not, not all the institutional boundaries of Pentecostalism. And this is a sector in global Christianity that has just grown gangbusters mm-hmm. in the last 50 years, starting in the 1970s. It's about um, sextupled in size, about seven times what it was in the 1970s today globally. And so the theory of the New Apostolic Reformation is about this return of apostles and prophets. And there was a seminary professor named C. Peter Wagner, who uh, was at Fuller Seminary, which is my alma mater. Um, and 
Wagner um, heard about these ideas, became uh, very captivated with these ideas, and start and, and helped coin this term "New Apostolic Reformation" to describe what he thought would be the the com- transformative role, the transformative work of the Holy Spirit in the church to bring about new apostles and prophets. And he believed that the 21st century, starting in 2001, would be a second apostolic age, akin to the life of the early church. Mm -hmm. And so he he coins or helps coin the term in 1996. And then in 1999, he retires from Fuller Seminary. So it's kind of theoretical up until that point. And he builds a set of institutions, a set of Mm -hmm. networks, um, starting in 1999 until his retirement in 2010, that gather together hundreds of these independent charismatic leaders who are all trying out being apostles and prophets and joining Wagner's networks, joining under this kind of new apostolic reformation umbrella in hopes of revolutionizing the church. And over time, um, especially uh, around 2007, 2008, you can really see this crystallize. Those movements became incredib- incredibly politically radicalized. They were already pretty radical, but um, they became radicalized around um, an idea called the Seven Mountain Mandate, uh, which came in through a particular leader named Lance Wall now, who was a mentee of Wagner's, um, but also around some, a set of ideas that we talk about as dominion theology, and I can go into that in great detail if you want. But through these kind of th- th- these, these political theology, these new apostolic reformation networks become very radicalized. And go in and, and really try to get into right wing politics in the United States and in other countries, um, and that they are kind of lingering around in right wing circles when Donald Trump declares his candidacy for the presidency, and they glom on to Donald Trump. They become some of the first leaders to endorse Donald Trump, and then they really become, in many ways, the vanguard of Christian Trumpism, both ideologically and theologically, offering frameworks offering prayer strategies, all to bolster Donald Trump and to lead Christians to supporting Donald Trump. And that takes them all the way up to January 6th and also to the present. Wow. I have so many questions for you. So you talk about latter rain. And uh, when I started helping people get out of cults, I got out of the Moonies in 1976. I encountered a group in I think it was 80 or 81 here in Boston called the uh, Boston Church of Christ. It used the shepherding discipleship model that you need to have someone over you to in authority that you submit to as if they were Jesus and they submit to their person and their person. Talk a little bit about that, that connection, if there is one, please. Yeah, so the as I said, we're talking about the independent charismatic Okay. Arena. Which so this are, group was not. This was just plain authority based submit right. to your it, human person as if they were Jesus. Yeah. So so what happens is these these, these latter rain ideas kind of suffuse that non denominational charismatic space that, yeah, that is, is is kind of small in the 1950s, 1960s. And then um, in the ni- in the late 1960s and early 1970s, you have a set of revivals, mostly centered in California, um, that we call either the Jesus people or the Jesus movement. Yeah. Um, th- these are hippies and ex-hippies who are all kind of converting to Christianity. A lot of uh, Jews actually convert in that moment, in, in that kind of era. Um, mm. Jews for Jesus as an organization is founded mm. out of the Jesus people. Um, and Messianic Judaism is, itself actually emerges as an independent charismatic movement in the 1970s uh, with these Jewish converts to Christianity kind of trying, they adopt these kind of charismatic spirituality and they try to, are trying to convert their fellow Jews to their version of Christianity. Yeah. Um, but also in the 1970s, as you have these kind of chaotic revivals, there's a set of leaders who take some of the latter rain frameworks, take some other frameworks and create what, what's called either the shepherding or the disciple move, the discipling movement. Um, and the, as you're saying, it's, it was a very authoritarian kind of structure, very rigid. Every person is supposed to have a shepherd. They're, that shepherd is supposed to have a shepherd, right? right. It's kind of a hierarchical structure. Pyramid shaped, and, yeah. And that those shepherding ideas um, are very influential. They're not only influential in the independent charismatic space, they're really influential across a lot of different streams of evangelicalism. Um, Amy Coney Barrett, um, the, the Supreme Court justice actually grew up in a charismatic Catholic community that was influenced by the shepherding. Movement, People right? of like, praise. I've done three blogs yeah. on them, and yeah. I've interviewed former victims of that cult. I call it an authoritarian group, since you mentioned uh, and, her. And, and that, that shepherding movement kind of fizzles out 
in the mid 1980s, even some of the the core leaders of it realize it's gotten really unhealthy and out of hand. Um, and it kind of disintegrates in the late 1980s, early 1990s. Mm-hmm. And it's, it, it's kind of the wellsprings, though. A lot of the people who were involved in the shepherding movement then join up with Peter Wagner, join up with these New Upstock Reformation networks, again, because they're, they, they are themselves rooted in these latter rain teachings and um, are, are excited and looking for a different kind of modality to live out the latter rain and see the NAR as, as, as another avenue for pursuing this that they, at least at the time, understood as to be less authoritarian and less rigid. Great. So I just want to ask you also, I'm friends with John Collins, who is a third-generation William Branham Message Church, which uh, he just did an incredible amount of research into Branham and all the false claims, etc. And he says that this was the beginning of the latter reign, like Branham was a fraud, who claimed to be a prophet, but that Jim Jones studied him and other people know anything about Branham's stuff? Yeah, so so William Branham um, was a, a, a healing evangelist, um, a Pentecostal healing evangelist, and he actually it was, so the latter rain didn't start with Branham, but it started with people who were inspired by Branham. So right. they, they went to one of Branham's revivals. It starts in Saskatchewan, Canada in 1948. And so there were a group of, of students at a Bible college, a Pentecostal Bible college, who went to a, a Branham revival and were, were inspired by it and came back and said, we want to have a revival too, and started praying intensely. And the latter rain emerged out of that. So he's kind of the, 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 the wellsprings in some ways, but he isn't really that tied into the latter rain networks. Branham's also very important. At the same time as this latter rain thing is emerging, you also have um, what are called the healing revivals mm. that uh, are spreading all over um, North America. And this is the 1950s. Um, Oral Roberts, uh, right. Kenneth Hagin, a lot of these folks come out of these healing revivals, right. Gordon Lindsay. And um, and so Branham is, is, is a, a very important and influential figure. He falls into great disrepute in the 1950s. Um, many people are, as, as you're saying, kind of very skeptical about some of his stories. Um, he becomes increasingly racist and, and misogynist yeah. in the 1950s, and his his core followers become very, very extreme. He dies in the 1960s, but he, he really also gives rise to a, a several white supremacist movements. I mean, it's uh, he, he has he has uh, this kind of uh, almost sprinkler effect. His ideas and his influence just kind of goes in all these different directions, and some of them very, very uh, grievous and, and terrible, and some of them maybe actually fairly helpful, depending on how you read the outcome right, of the healing revivals. Right, but there's definitely a mutation, and especially if yeah. people are born in one of these groups leave, and then they go on to start their own. Quick question. With the NAR, coming back to them, what's the criteria for being an apostle or a prophet? Do you just say, I, I prayed and God spoke to me and gave me this gift? Or is there any kind of criteria to accept people as you know real or not real? So they, the, the, the NAR leaders themselves understand, and especially Peter Wagner, because he's in many ways the kind of intellectual godfather of the movement, um, they understand the calling and gifting of an apostle as something that is given by the Holy Spirit, yeah. but that is confirmed by the community. And so uh, I, I, they, they, they very much bristle when people talk about them as self-proclaimed apostles, because it, apostle is a title in their movement for a religious leader in the same way that rabbi is a title for a religious leader in Jewish communities or pastor or priest, right? And so um, the, 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 in their communities, it is the, their community and then their fellow apostles or fellow prophets who recognize it. And Wagner, when he so he's, he helped found an organization called the International Coalition of Apostles that at its height under his leadership had about 500 apostles in it. But Wagner had very strict standards um, for who could be a member of the International Coalition of Apostles. He wanted to see that they had founded multiple ministries that had experienced exponential growth. He wanted to see that they had a long history of leadership and that they were vouched for by other apostles. So the ICA actually started as an exclusive club. Like you, you, if, if you go and try to look at the website when it was founded around to the year 2000, it's, it's password protected and blocked. They were not trying to be very public. They wanted it to be kind of an exclusive club that you really had to pay your dues and prove yourself to get into. Um, and then over time, the, it became more open to, to other folks. But the, Wagner was he. I, I I've been through his archives. 
there are a number of people he just rejected. He says, no, your, your church isn't big enough. No, you're, you don't have enough ministry history. You are not qualified to be an apostle. Now, because this is a non-denominational space, those people can still call themselves apostles, right? right. They just wouldn't be under the NAR imprimatur, under, under the ICA. So there are people who um, will just pop up and out of these latter rain ideas say, well, I, I had a vision from God. I'm an apostle. But the, the reputable apostles in the movement would actually look at that with a jaundiced eye and would question that and say, well, but are you a real apostle? Because we have these other verification modes and you might not fit our criteria. So I need to ask you this because um, I've been watching uh, news excerpts of uh, Michael Shamblin talking about his mother, Gwen Shamblin of the Remnant Fellowship um, Church in Tennessee. And she called herself an apostle, and he's now, because he grew up in it, is like revealing the what's actually happening inside and the abuse that was going on. And and but she the, the, the she she died in a plane crash uh, with a number of other people, but people are still in the church idolizing her as an apostle. Well, and, and these latter rain ideas, they, they've got a long tail life, and, and they, 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 they have a lot of effects in this world. And there, even when Wagner is talking about this in the 1990s, there are a lot of other people who are talking about this apostles and prophets idea. It's not original to Wagner in any way. Right. And there are a bunch of people who are interested in these ideas who don't join Wagner's networks. So one of, one of our prominent examples of this is Bethel church in Redding, California. Mm -hmm. Many people have labeled Bethel part of the NAR, but actually Bill Johnson, who's the apostle at Bethel, and Chris Valentin, who's the, the lead prophet there, they, they actually stayed clear of Wagner's networks. They didn't, they didn't want to join mm -hmm. Wagner's networks. They didn't want to be under his leadership. They wanted to do their own thing. So they're still playing around with the same set of ideas. They're often hanging out with NAR people, but they're maintaining a formal distance from it. Um, and so what you'll find is that in this independent charismatic space, in this non-denominational space, there are a lot of people who are pl still playing with these ideas. Some of them go back to Wagner's networks and some don't. Some of them are radicalized and some are not. So I think we need to be attentive to the reality that, that NAR is a title that a lot of people want to attach to anyone who calls himself an apostle. But that wasn't how Wagner thought about it. That wasn't how his contemporaries thought about it. That isn't how people who are in those worlds think about these things. Great. They think of the NAR as a as a conscribed set of, prescribed set of networks that 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 Wagner himself creates. So interesting. So as a Jew uh, who studied Torah, um, my understanding from my scripture or my tribe scripture is that if a prophet makes a prophecy and it doesn't come true. They should be stoned to death. It's like you know if they're a prophet if it comes true, um, and uh, and 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 when when a lot of NAR people said God said Trump won the 2020 election, Biden stole it, by Satan stole it, it created a bit of a schism, if I understand correctly, amongst those that stuck with their original prophecy that Trump won to, well, maybe we need to rethink this. Love to hear your ideas. Yeah, let me let me make one quick point about Old Testament, Hebrew Bible, Please. prophecy, and New Testament prophecy, because it, it's an important distinction for people within that world. Good. Um, so yes, so there are passages in the Hebrew Bible or Torah or Old yeah. Testament, what Christians call it, um, that, that, that prescribe death for false prophets. Um, and th th you find these passages in Levitical law and, and um, some other passages. Um, within the NAR, and also within most independent charismatic uh, communities, there's a, they, they would make a separation between what they would call Old Testament prophecy and New Testament prophecy. And the, the, the distinction that they would make is, in the Old Testament, prophets are hearing directly from God and are labeling themselves prophets, and so there's, as with many things, as they would say in the Old Testament, there are stricter rules around what's going on. And that they would say there's more license in the New Testament for people to explore mm. spiritual gifts, for people to grow into spiritual gifts. And with the leadership of the apostles, that they can regulate the ways that prophets operate and keep them in check, and so that you don't you don't need the death penalty. Basically, mm -hmm. um, the other thing that you have to realize about the way these folks think about prophecy, and this is very important, is not widely understood, is 
they have a belief in what theologically or formally we would call the openness of God or open theism, mm-hmm. which is a, 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 it's a conversation that emerges, especially in evangelicalism in the 1990s. Um, and the idea is that God may be all-powerful, but God values human free will. Again, we're, we're back in Eden. And God values the ability of humans, especially Christians, to participate and pray and wants to make their prayers and Christians' efforts meaningful. And so God has not predetermined everything about the future. In other words, God's will can be thwarted. Mm-hmm. And this is where you come, we bring in concepts of spiritual warfare and the idea that Satan and demons are opposed to the will of God. So God wants things. You have this oppositional force in the form of Satan and demons. And the role of Christians and the role of prophets is to declare the will of God and then to enact that will through spiritual warfare. So when all these prophets are saying that Donald Trump, God has ordained Donald Trump to win the 2020 election, what they actually mean is God wants Trump to be the president, but we have to make that happen through spiritual warfare, through activism, through through combat in the spiritual realm. And this is what January 6th is really about in many ways, is people believing these prophecies, but believing that they need to help enact those prophecies through spiritual warfare. And a lot of the spirituality that, that gives rise to January 6th, or at least to the, the, the spiritual manifestations we see on January 6th, comes out of this idea that the crucial role of Christians, the crucial role of spiritual warriors, as we talk about in, in our documentary, is to make the prophecies come true. So the, the, that that's a that's an important distinction within these circles. I get you, not all Christians believe that, right? That, right? that is kind of a unique set of beliefs. But yes, yeah, so after um, January 6th, there were a number of leaders, especially apostles, who felt like there was a lot of egg on their faces. Um, with there, there were hundreds of charismatic prophets who prophesied that Donald Trump was going to win in 2020. Um, and when the election was called for Joe Biden, um, only a tiny handful of those prophets recanted their prophecies. Um, and some of them recanted their prophecies after January 6th, and a few of those even got death threats, right? So it was, it was a very contentious issue in this independent charismatic space. Um, but then in April of 2021, so a few months after January 6th, um, a group of, some of them are coming out of these NAR networks. Many of them are from outside the NAR networks, but are a part of this apostolic prophetic movement. Um, they, they put out a statement called the Prophetic Standards Statement. Um, you, if you just Google Prophetic Standards Statements, you can, they have a website, you can read it, you can see all the signatories. Um, and the, the idea was trying to kind of rein in, especially these political prophecies. And I've talked to many of the people who, who are signatories to that, and organizers for it. In one of the early drafts that actually named Trump and named these Trump prophecies, and, and, and called them out as, as being wrong. Um, they wanted to get making a big tent, and so they wound up actually taking that language out so they could get more signatories. Um, and in my view, it's a, it, the, the final statement is very me- mealy-mouthed and confusing for that reason, mm. right? It's, 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 if, if you're coming from the outside, it's very hard to parse exactly what they're saying in that statement, in part, I think, because they wanted to, to get as many signatories as possible, and they watered down the original message. So am I is my reading of the New Testament off when I have the opinion that Jesus when asked about being offered a kingdom by Satan he was like no I'm not interested in this earthly you know like render unto Caesar Caesar and like talk to me about the Christian point of view versus the Dominionism, Christian nationalism, we got to take over the government and, you know, enact policies that uh, take away rights of minorities. One of the major criticisms that you'll hear, especially in evangelical circles of the NAR, is that they are unbiblical. And I think that is a false criticism. Mm. I think they are very biblical. Right, they they are referencing the Bible. They are citing the Bible. They are very um, well versed in their um, understanding of the New Testament. They have a very different interpretation than what I would call mainstream Christianity. Um, so, in mainstream Christianity, yes, we we look back, we 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 read the teachings of Jesus, um, and the the Jesus is um, one one of the most distinctive characteristics of Jesus that I see when I read the New Testament is that he is someone who is pushing back every time people try to impose earthly power 
upon him, mm-hmm. right? He, he talks about um, the rulers of the Gentiles are tyrants over them, and not so among my followers, right? That don't be a tyrant. D- instead, become the servant of all. Become even uses the term be, be the slave of all, serve so that you can have greatness, right? Mm-hmm. So serve others. That is the path to greatness. That is the path to leadership in the kingdom of God. There are other passages, though. In fact, the, the title of my book. Um, the, the violent taken by force comes from a very strange saying of Jesus in Matthew chapter 11, where he's referring to the death of his cousin, John the Baptist. And he says, since the days of John the Baptist, um, the, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Hmm. And Christian interpreters are very divided over how to understand this passage. Is Jesus endorsing violence? Is he saying Violent people are inflicting suffering on people like my cousin, John the Baptist, and they are taking the kingdom of heaven by force somehow. It's, it's, it's a hard passage to interpret. Within the NAR, they understand Jesus as giving a mandate to do spiritual violence to bring about the kingdom of God. Hmm. Right? So that's Wagner, the C. Peter Wagner's interpretation of that passage, and it's very common today among many um, charismatic folks just to understand that as a mandate for spiritual violence. Similarly, you can find passages in the book of Revelation where Jesus is being crowned as the king of all creation, where Jesus is coming with a sword to conquer the earth, right? Now, those are prophetic and apocalyptic passages, Mm -hmm. but the NAR leaders say, no, that is the modality of God now. Jesus was meek and mild and eschewed earthly power, but ultimately he takes power and we are helping to enact that. So again, that's not a mainstream interpretation. That's not, that's not where most Christians go with those passages, but they are rooting it in scripture. They are interpreting scripture. They're finding reasons and passages that speak to this sort of uh, dominion spirituality that, again, is, is, is very important to their political vision. Right. I think it's a very dangerous political vision. I think, right. I think it's a very bad interpretation of Christianity, but it is a Christian interpretation. Right. So when when I would do cases involving Christian cults, I would always bring a minister with me, someone who's seminary trained, um, to speak about the faith. And, and uh, they explained to me the difference between eisegesis and exegesis, and I would listen as they would explain, you can't just take one verse. You have to read what came before, what came behind. You need to put Jesus's words higher than Paul's, or at least in the context of Jesus's words to understand it. Expound on that. Is Am I wrong? Am I like, explain what the difference between like confirmation bias? Yeah, I have an idea that God likes to lie to people, which is what I was taught in the Moonies, and you know, cherry-pick stories to illustrate that it was fine for us to lie to people when we were recruiting them uh, and saying we're not religious, and then we would convert them. So the the, the entire field of what we're talking about here, formally we we call it hermeneutics, right? And the the practice of interpreting texts. Okay. And yeah, generally, um, at least within the Christian kind of approach to hermeneutics, um, there the 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 goal is exegesis, right? Right. At least at least I'd say. For Protestants, the goal is exegesis. The, the Catholic tradition gives a lot more weight to the teaching of the church and the interpretation of the church. Okay. But for, for Protestants, with this kind of sola scriptura value system, you want to find the meaning of the text from the text and let it speak into your world. Mm-hmm. The, then eisegesis is um, sometimes castigated as the wrong approach, which is the idea that you're bringing outside ideas and trying to read them into the text, right? Right. You, it's 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 not the, the meaning is not coming from the text. You're reading it into the text. Mm-hmm. The the problem with that distinction, mm-hmm. just speaking as a religious studies person, I'm is asking there is, <laughs> you are. There, there, there is no single Christian hermeneutic. There is no single Christian interpretation. There's no single Christian mode of interpreting the Bible that leads to inevitable conclusions, mm-hmm. right? And that the history of Protestantism is a history of people doing exegesis and coming to extremely different conclusions and then fighting about it, sometimes quite violently fighting about it. I mean, the, the modern international system that we have today mm-hmm. um, emerges in the middle of the 17th century in large part because Protestants are fighting with each other 
and those fights are turning into national wars and they're being leveraged for national inter international wars and the catholics are getting involved and sometimes the ottoman turks and muslims are getting involved and europe is just a hash in the middle of the, right. of the 17th century and so the the these differences in interpretation are really important in my view the the way that the new apostolic reformation reads the bible it's not my way of reading the bible it's not my way of governing the church but it fits within the four corners of Christian orthodoxy, broadly defined. Mm. They are not heretics. They are, they're, they're choosing a different mode for governing the church, but there's a lot of different ways that Christians approach governing the church, right? And so they, I don't think it's a wise approach to governing the church. I think that's got a lot of problems. And you mentioned some of the scandals that have emerged, and this is endemic in this approach of, right. kind of apostles and prophets, because it is a, a, a more authoritarian model of church governance. You're investing a great amount of authority and power in individuals right. um, and then entrusting them that somehow in their integrity, they will not violate those, the, 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 those, the power that they have. They will not turn into tyrants. Um, and many of them do, right? So it is, it's not a wise approach to governing the church in my view, but it is Christian. And, and one of the, just, just to give a data point here, um, I, I have a, a colleague named Paul Jupe, who is a sociologist of religion. And um, he and I worked together on design, designing a survey about these specific NAR beliefs. Some of these, these ideas like apostles and prophets are, exist today and are integral to the leadership of the church, right? In my upbringing as an evangelical, I would have said, absolutely not. I, I've never even heard of that. But 62% in our survey of evangelical Christians, self-identified evangelicals in the United States said they either agree or strongly agree with that statement. We talked about spiritual warfare and this idea of territorial spirits that needed to be displaced through campaigns of spiritual warfare, another very signature NAR idea. Again, more than 50% of self-identified evangelicals say yes to that. So these beliefs have become increasingly mainstream in evangelicalism, especially in the last decade, and they've really taken root, especially in the United States and especially in right-wing Christian circles, and they've become integrated into right-wing Christian organizing, into right-wing Christian theology, and they, they are today, um, in many ways, uh, as mainstream as just about anything you can say with evangelicals. Evangelicals has always been a big coalitional umbrella movement that does not right. have a particular theology or church governance. It's it's open to a lot of different interpretations. These people are pretty darn evangelical today, and they're mainstream in a way that they weren't even 15 years ago. Yeah, so I come from, you know, exiting the Moonies cult, learning about psychological warfare and brainwashing and mind control done by state actors who want to use religious groups as proxies for doing dastardly deeds and having some distance from, from themselves. And I guess I'm more cynical uh, than you, and I understand you're an academic and you're part of an institute that wants you know ecumenicism, but I just think that there's a deliberate effort to recruit and indoctrinate people to be more extreme and to message in that way. And I wanted to share quickly a story of me in the Moonies, two quick stories. One is I'm, I'm in the Moonies and I'm taken with a few hundred members to see the Exorcist movie in 1974. Then we get in vans, we go up to Tarrytown to see Father Moon, the 10 times greater than Jesus Christ, who said Jesus failed in his mission. He should never have gone to the cross. And he gives a speech about how God made this movie. This movie is a prophecy of what will happen if you leave the Unification Church, to which when I got out of the group and I studied psychology as a licensed professional, I realized, oh, that was the point where a phobia was put in my mind to distrust my own thinking, my own conscience. And the way it looks to me is when I talk to people who are leaving NAR groups and they talk about needing to follow the prophet or the apostle blindly because otherwise they would lose his covering or her covering of satanic invasion and then they may need an exorcism to be saved. 
So I want to share that one. Then the other quick story is just, I hated Nixon before the Moonies. I get in the Moonies and, and I'm told God chose Nixon to be president. Even though there's Watergate, we're going to fast for three days because God said that Nixon should stay president despite all of his crimes. So those are two personal experiences for me. I know it wasn't mainstream Christianity, even though the Moonies would give millions to people like Jerry Falwell and other ministries. So anyway, I'd love to hear what you, your reaction. My, my first reaction is, as somebody who did their PhD at Georgetown University, I, I have a special affection for the film The Exorcist because it was filmed there in Georgetown, and I used to walk up and down the stairs right next to where <laughs> where the, the final scene, you know, where he goes tumbling down the stairs. Right, that I, I I used to walk those stairs all the time. Um, so there's different forms, I'd say, of religious extremism, right? So there there's religious extremism that is um, hyper politicized and instrumentalized by outside actors in order to um, accomplish some sort of political ends right right and it sounds like that's some of what you are describing from your experience with the moonies right and 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 often when you're thinking about that type of religious extremism it's it's really an open question and i think very much open to doubt whether the people who are doing the instrumentalizing the people who are kind of galvanizing this sort of extremism really believe it right right because a lot of times it's, it's it's just another form of manipulation or they're they're in it for the money they're in it for the politics right and i think a lot of times our tendency coming out of a certain cynical cast of mind is to assume that all religious extremism is that type of religious extremism, that these leaders are insincere, that they don't really believe it, that their true motives are profit or power or um, the politics. and Power, and money, and leverage. sex are the three biggies with cult leaders. But I have interviewed quite a number of NAR leaders. Mm -hmm. I have, I, I, I'm, I'm inside their correspondence. Mm -hmm. I can see the conversations they're having with each other. These folks really believe this. Oh, I, right? I believed people. it. I was a fanatical Mooney and I indoctrinated people and whether or not Moon actually believed it, I kind of thought he, he did, especially if you're surrounded by true, true believers or people or yes people. Who are afraid of being kicked out, but I don't. I'm but, not but sure that's the measure of sincerity. No, no, no. I'm, but I'm saying, I'm saying the the new absolute revelation. I, I very much make this case. I think they are very extreme, right, in their Christianity. But it's, a, it's an extremism and a radicalization that is coming through theology, and not just through manipulation. No, I totally so it, agree right? with that. Yeah, no, the, the so, so scriptures th used, theology's used for sure. And but again, it's not it's not they're using theology, it's their theology is radicalizing them. So so let, let, me, let me give an example. So Peter Wagner comes out of mainstream evangelicalism. And as he moves into these kind of independent charismatic and then NAR circles, he has been given all these different prophecies from mm -hmm. different prophets who are telling him, Hey, you're an apostle. And you're called to lead this global movement, and right, and he he deeply believes that, and he never made great profits in terms of money off of this. I mean, apparently, he made a great number right. of great profits with a PH, right? But like, he never made a lot of money. He was never, and and you can say that he was megalomaniacal in certain ways in his desire for power. But Peter Wagner genuinely believed that he was bringing about a great reformation in the life of the church. He thought of himself as a sort of Martin Luther type character. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about the ways that radicalization happens, there's a, there's a version of religious extremism that is insincere and there's a danger to that. I almost think the true believer kind of extremism is more dangerous. Oh, absolutely. Because, because if, if somebody's insincere, if they're a huckster, or if they're in it for cynical reasons or for profit, you can kind of assess what their motives are and sort of predict where they're Absolutely, going to take Absolutely, thousand percent. But the, the true believers, and this is again that what, what fuels January 6th is people who truly and deeply believe that their presence there in Washington, D.C., around the Capitol, or their prayers and intercession from, from uh, remote locations is going to change the spiritual atmosphere, is going to displace, displace the demons 
that have stolen the election from Donald Trump, and that through spiritual warfare, through these kind of different practices, through prophecy, through apostolic decrees, they can change the outcome of the election. Right. And they can get Donald Trump back in office. And that, that there's almost a free radical dimension to that true believer piece that's a lot harder to predict and almost makes it more dangerous in that way. Yeah. And I think that is what's more behind January 6th. There were, I'm sure that, yes, I, and, and I have documentation both in my book and in our series about the way that the Trump administration was trying to galvanize and get these folks uh, uh, up to a high boil of rage. Number of NAR leaders, and I, I, I actually was the one who uncovered this, on December 29, 2020, a group of 15 NAR leaders had a two-hour meeting at the White House with unnamed Trump administration officials where they were doing apostolic decrees, and they come out of this meeting describing we were receiving strategy from people at the highest levels of our government. These are some of the same people who then show up on January 6th, mm. who are leading people, or moving and mobilizing people to be there on January 6th. Right. So I do think there is an instrumentalization that is happening there, but it's more happening through kind of the White House, where these folks are the true believers, right? Right, And they're, they're acting out of their theology. Right. No, I, I totally agree. So I could talk with you for hours, but I need to ask you about prosperity uh, stuff where, give you know, put it on your credit card and you'll get it 10 times back and I need another plane or I need another mansion. And am I wrong that that was not what Jesus taught at all? Well, again, <laughs> I, I, I'm using my, my religious studies yeah. scholar here. I, 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 can, I can say as a Christian what I believe Jesus taught, but the, the people who teach the prosperity gospel, they're also quoting Jesus. I, again, I would say misquoting Jesus, but it's a bad interpretation, not an, a heretical interpretation, I guess I'd I put it. I thought it was so, harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, that quote. With oh, the, what they, is, they've got no? fancy footwork to get around all these passages. So the, the 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 thing we today call the prosperity gospel, at least most of what we call the prosperity gospel, there are different versions of it, but most of what it is actually comes out of those healing revivals. So you've got Branham in the 1940s, you've got the latter rain that kicks off in 1948, and then these healing revivals actually are going throughout the, the 1950s, and there's a, a healing revivalist named Kenneth Hagin, yeah. who is, is one of these kind of itinerant, healing evangelist who's going around right. and then he sets up shop in Tulsa and um, and really starts teaching and become this becomes the teaching called the word of faith mm. movement which is most of what we talk about as the prosperity gospel it's another independent charismatic movement or current that dovetails at times with the NAR many of the NAR people um, hang out with word of faith leaders sometimes uh, participate in some of these word of faith teachings, but it's 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 a, a different stream mm. that that sometimes intersects mm. with the the NAR. Um, and but this, this prosperity gospel piece or the, the the word of faith movement was also very important for backstopping Donald Trump. Paula White Kane, yes. who is uh, Donald Trump's uh, closest spiritual advisor um, and was the chair of his evangelical advisory board, still is. It's now called the National Faith Advisory Board for the 2024 campaign. Um, Paula White uh, Kane uh, came up in word of faith circles, and she um, was very influenced by that. She's also influenced by the latter rain apostles and prophets idea. So mm. she's um, she talks about herself as an apostle, but she wasn't part of Wagner's network. Mm. She's another one of these figures who kind of came to that even a little later than Wagner, more around like 2011 or 2012 was when she first started talking about mm -hmm. that. This was after Wagner retired. Um, but she's very, very influential. And when So part of the backstory of how evangelicals came to support Trump, and I, I get into this a lot in my book, um, is Trump declares that he uh, is going to be a candidate for the president in June of 2015. Um, and if you remember back early on in that primary, evangelicals, at least respectable evangelicals, didn't want anything to do with Trump. No. Right? The, right. the evangelical elites especially. But the grassroots were very interested in Trump. And starting in July of 2015, you can see this in polls, Trump is getting a plurality of the evangelical vote. Now, there's like 16 people in the race at that point, right? So he's getting like 20% of the evangelical vote, but that's still more than anyone else. Mm. And so that fall, fall of 2015, Trump says to Paula White, I want you to be my bridge to the evangelicals. Mm. And I want you to bring evangelical leaders in and I want to meet with them mm. at Trump Tower. The problem is Paula White doesn't know mainstream evangelical leaders. She doesn't know the James Dobson's and Jerry Falwell types. She knows 
prosperity gospel people. She uh-huh. knows televangelists because she's a televangelist. She knows right. apostles and prophets. Those are the people that she brings in to start meeting with Trump. These are the first Christian leaders who actually gather with candidate Trump in the fall of 2015, including Lance Wallnow, a major NAR leader, but a bunch of other people like Kenneth Copeland, who's more of a word of faith guy, right? And these are all people who are meeting with Trump and then get in at the ground floor of the Trump campaign. Yep. And then the polarity reverses in the course of that campaign to where the mainstream evangelicals, as Trump consolidates the primary and starts winning all these primaries, the mainstream evangelicals are coming hat in hand to Paula White and saying, hey, we need access to Trump. And she becomes the gatekeeper mm. in that world. And so everything has to flow through her and through these kind of independent charismatic advisors to Trump. Mm. And this changes. It's a tectonic shift in the leadership of the religious right. Because suddenly these people who were marginal and fringe and even laughable 10 years before are suddenly now at the heart of the religious right and hold a lot of power. Right. And that, has, that, is a, that is a process that is still ongoing. You're seeing more and more of these kind of rogue, renegade, independent charismatic types who are now on the front lines of the culture wars, locally and nationally. And they're driving the action of the religious right. And they are it's, it's creating a different dynamic than we've ever seen in the religious right in America. Yeah, when I read the book, New Apostolic Reformation, I'm forgetting the author. I'm sure you know who it was. This is the John Weaver? Yes, exactly. He talked about how high tech they were. Yeah. That they really knew how to do social media, how to message, how to use technology. And again, I'm my background is training in social psychology and uh, persuasion and attitude change. And now with the world that we live in currently, with all this privacy data where people can purchase it on, on the web, this group in uh, called Glue in Colorado will sell it to churches to find who's depressed or, you know, he is uh, suicidal or whatever, and to recruit them. So want to comment on Christianity in the digital age, uh, this part of this thing that's happening? Evangelical Christianity has always been um, very forward-leading when it comes to technology. Um, evangelicals, I mean, if you go back, the, the, the Protestant Reformation itself is in many ways a product of the printing press, oh, right. right? Luther and these tracks, right? That there's new technology and suddenly it fuels a religious revolution. Um, evangelicals created megachurches. Evangelicals cr- were pioneered radio preaching and then televangelism. And they, they are incredibly adept. And, and when you have the rise of Pentecostalism, Pentecostalism is in many ways um, a, a more accelerated version of that. Pentecostals are very adept at at adopting new technologies and and then leveraging those for the growth of their movement. Um, And so by the time you get to the 1970s, 1980s, these are the folks who are the leading televangelism ministries. These are the folks who are, are, are driving things. And then when with the internet age, in fact, the megachurch movement, Paula White Kane is one of the, the pioneers, the real leaders in the megachurch movement. Mm-hmm. She was one of the, 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 she was leading one of the top megachurches in the year 2000 in the country, one of the top 10 megachurches in the country. And th- this was a fairly new technology that she was, and many other people were adopting. So they're very creative very entrepreneurial people. They're also in this ecosystem or marketplace that requires them to be entrepreneurial, right? They don't just have a brick and mortar church that they can rely on people to come to. They have to attract audiences. They have to right. speak to big audiences. And so they they very adeptly use YouTube, the, the use social media. These prophets are all over those platforms. Right. They are now using Rumble and Gab and all these other social right. media. TikTok. I mean, this is, they are natives in the digital space. Right. So um, we're, we're going to wrap up shortly. I could talk to you for hours, but I guess I want to ask you to talk to any listener uh, who maybe is in one of the NAR groups that was believing that Satan is in the Democrats and that they're, you know, trafficking children and using their blood for adrenochrome and other QAnon things. Like what as a Christian Protestant scholar, what words may you share? So I I think, let me just say from the start, I am not Mm anti-charismatic. I am not 
I, I am not out to malign or castigate people. If you listen to my podcast, if you read my book, if you watch our documentary, I try to give as accurate a rendering of what these folks have actually done in their own words. I've interviewed many of them and tried to talk to them and tried to understand where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. And I am convinced, having talked to many of them, that they are a grave menace to American society. A grave are, menace to American uh, society. They are very, very dangerous. And it's not, it's not because they're charismatic. Right. It's not even because they're apostles and prophets. It is because they are hyper-politicizing and hyper-charging this charismatic spirituality and orienting it around politics and radicalizing people in the process. Mm -hmm. Right? It's, it, it's people, we, we live in a, in a culture of religious freedom. That is the First Amendment. Right. People have the freedom to believe and to practice their religion. And I'm not in any way trying to infringe upon people's right or freedom to practice their religion. But we also exist in a society and we have civic responsibilities in that society. And so if somebody is immersed in that world, I just want to say, I am not your enemy. I am not out to get you. I don't want to demonize you, even though I, I frequently get demonized by people in that world, oh, yeah. like, literally, right? But but the, the, the truth is that we need to live in a society together. It is a complicated thing to live in, in a multi-religious, multi-racial, pluralistic democracy. Mm -hmm. And that is what we are trying to do in the United States. That That is the best vision of the United States is a multi-religious and multi-racial pluralistic democracy where everyone is equal, where everyone has freedom. And the danger of what I would call Christian supremacy, which I think the NAR is one major brand right. of Christian supremacy, the danger of that is it wants to take away the rights of other people right. to live and to be who they are and to live out the values that they have. Right. And there's this deep temptation to believe that if somebody is different than me, if somebody is not a Christian, or if somebody is a Christian who disagrees with me, they must be inspired by demons. And this is kind of baked into NAR theology and NAR ideology in many ways. And I just want to say, the people that you disagree with are real people with real values, who also want to be able to vote their conscience, who also want to be able to participate in a free society. And I think that that is, in many ways, it's that impulse to neighborliness, to common humanity, right. that I think can save us in this moment, that we need to humanize ourselves, humanize others, right. and then acknowledge that, that we all have to exist in society together. And Jesus was very clear on this, about what it means to be a neighbor and to treat your neighbors as you would want to be treated. So I would just say to anyone who is immersed in this kind of NAR world or NAR ideology, are you being a neighbor mm. to your neighbors? Are you treating them the way you want to be treated? Or are you trying to impose your religious views or your understanding of demons upon them? And what would it look like to treat them as neighbors, especially in a deeply contentious and polarized environment that we're facing right now? Beautifully said. I almost want to end there, but I just want to say over the decades, I've worked with more than a few people who underwent many exorcisms and uh, it was traumatic for them. But when I asked them what was the beginning of why they needed exorcism, they had doubts about being a part of that community or that church. And I, I actually wrote a letter to a judge on behalf of a man who was in a, one of these cults, and his 15-year-old son wanted to leave the cult, and he was told by the leader that his son had demons, and as a good father, he needed to beat the spirit out of him, and he killed his son and is serving in jail right now. And he believed the prophet over his conscience and his fatherly, you know, authority. Yeah, and I, I think I think conscience is something we all have. We can we can mask it, we can shut it down. We can systematically abuse our conscience and get it to think the wrong thing, but it's still there. And, and, and I think that is just a part of our humanity. And I would call upon people who may be drawn into sort of extreme uh, mobilization, especially around this 2024 election as we're, we're coming into this deeply polarized time. I just say, try to access that deep conscience that you have. And, and, and you can find it right there in the teachings of Jesus treat others how you would want to be treated. I think that is, in many ways, the best out of our Abrahamic traditions, 
they all call us to that. Right. That's the best that we can ask of humanity is that we would it, treat our fellow human beings right. with a reciprocity of kind of respect and honor and understanding the integrity and then learning from them. Right. And that, that's the beauty of America in many ways. Through our religious freedom, we have this great cross-pollination and learning project, an interreligious learning that has gone on. Yeah, I, I love your 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 values and your position. And I'll just say as a former cult member who coaches people how to talk to cult members, I say, don't try to attack the leader, the doctrine, or the policy. Don't try to use facts and force it down people's throat. Active listening, respectful dialogue, ask questions and be patient and wait for the person to think about it. And the best thing is to like use case examples of groups you know they think are authoritarian brainwashing cults, like Heaven's Gate, for example, or Jim Jones, and, and ask questions. How is your commitment different than the people at of the People's Temple back in 1978? And just let because they you can activate people's conscience and their mm. common sense even. Inshallah, as my Muslim friends would say. Inshallah. Last words. Uh, I I'm just very conscious that we. Um, uh, I I would love for my restriction to January six to be a, a historical episode that we can um, spend many years uh, kind of discussing and thinking over and, and analyzing. We are living in very urgent times right now. Urgent and times, indeed. And your new book, The Violent Take It By Force, The Christian Movement That Is Threatening Our Democracy. Can I ask when it's scheduled to come out? It's available for pre-order now. Um, the publication date is September 24th, um, so about, about a month and a half before the election. But if you pre-order it, you should be getting it in August. So oh, um, do, do pre-order it. Great. Uh, Matthew D. Taylor, PhD, Senior Scholar for the Institute for Islamic, Christian, and Jewish Studies. I'd actually like to have you back to talk about Muslim, your studies with Muslims. We didn't get a chance, but I think this is the most important um, uh, angle to share with our listeners. Thank you again. Thank you, Steve. I'd love to come back. Okay, great. Steve Hassan here. You know, it's been decades since my family rescued me from the Moonies. I've been at this for over 47 years. The need has never been greater. If you're able, please consider hitting the super thanks button below and it'll help us to do better. Every penny will help us toward our goal of educating the planet about undue influence. Remember, it's your mind, only you should control it. Thank you.